and thank you for joining us for our Chats on the Past program, where the museum discusses history with scholars, authors, historians, and artisans. My name is Claire Menard, and I am the Programs Manager here at the Westport Museum for History and Culture. At the museum, we are pleased to offer free programming. We do have a donation link if you are so inclined. The Westport Museum is not an agency of the town of Westport, so any support you can offer us is greatly appreciated. If at any point during our program you have questions, please enter them in the comments box. We will go through appropriate comments and questions at the end of our discussion. We are joined today by Deirdre Mask, the author of The Address Book, What Street Addresses Reveal About Identity, Race, Wealth, and Power. The Address Book gives us the fascinating histories of street names ranging from ancient Rome to modern times, as well as revealing the reality of millions today who live without street addresses. As we will hear, street names tell us far more than where we are on a map. They show us who has the power to name our land and who was deemed important enough to have their names written into our very landscape. Ms. Mask, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Claire. I apologize for this glare. I'm saying this is the one sunny day in London, and I'm out in a in our, our yeah. back garden in an office. So apologies. Has great timing, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so diving just right into the questions, um, what I'm really curious about is how did you get interested in the history and politics of street addresses? Yes, it was really unusual because this is not my background at all. I actually trained as a lawyer. But it was one of these sort of deep dives. I was actually living in Ireland at the time, and I was sending a birthday card um, to my dad. And I, I was just, you know, had this thought. So when I put a stamp on the letter and I pay for it in euros, you know, how does the U.S. post office get its cut? Like, how does this whole international mail thing work? So I ended up uh, going into an internet deep dive, and I ended up at an, an organization called the Universal Postal Union which I think sounds purposely boring um, because it's actually incredibly fascinating. It's the second oldest UN organization and it organizes and coordinates the world's map. But I quickly got distracted because there was um, a big program that they were advertising on their website called uh, Addressing the World, an Address for Everyone, where they said that the World Bank um, thought that giving everyone in, in the world an address was one of the easiest and cheapest ways to lift people out of poverty. And I thought this was just totally bizarre. I just had never heard. Um, I've never even thought that there are people who didn't have addresses and never thought that it was linked at all to, to poverty. But this actually sent me in a different direction because the more I read about this, the more I realized that people in my own country uh, didn't have street addresses. And this led me to West Virginia, where I wrote an article for the Atlantic magazine about uh, parts of rural West Virginia that didn't have street names and that were getting them. And they weren't always happy about it. Um, and this uh, this sort of led uh, to, to the wide range of other street naming stories. And after that article got published, I just had so many people writing to me of the street name stories from, you know, in Beirut and in Edinburgh and all around the world um, that I kept on looking and I kept on finding. And that's sort of the origins of the book. Awesome. I know you, I uh, noticed you mentioned Edinburgh. I remember um, I did a semester in Edinburgh and one of my hobbies was getting lost in reading the street names because they were weird. <laughs> Very different from America's street names for sure. Very different, yes. <laughs> so while researching the address book, uh, yeah. what kind of places did you visit and what kind of sources did you frequently use? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I did do a lot of travel. So, you know, one of my early trips was I went to India. So uh, one of the first chapters in the book is about Kolkata. Uh, and it's about how um, the slums of Kolkata, and I use that word, that's a term of art that the government uses. Um, slums in Kolkata are really varied. Some are about as you would imagine it, and some are actually more like sort of neighborhoods and villages. But these are people are basically squatting. They don't have legal rights to the land. And how these places didn't have street addresses. And there was an organization that was going in to give people street addresses. Because without street addresses, um, you know, there are these problems that people couldn't get mail, obviously. They had no privacy in the mail. But more importantly, a street address is a, is, a, is a badge of identity. So it's harder to get identity cards. It's pretty much impossible to bank or get credit, which as we know in a capitalist world is the way you lift yourself out of poverty. So I went there and followed a team for a week uh, that was going through and addressing uh, Kolkata. So that was one of my early travels. But I went all over the place. I went to 
New York and St. Louis and Vienna, and I live in London, which is where I'm from now. Um, lots of other places, and yeah, in Europe and all around the world. So, um, so that was travel was a big part of it, but a lot of it was just time spent in the good old British Library here in London. Um, I would start writing a chapter and pulling a thread. So I'd start to write a chapter about South Africa street names, which meant that I had to learn more about apartheid, which meant I had to spend a day reading, you know, as many biographies as Nelson Mandela. And then that leads you to the Boer War. And then that leads you to the Constitutional Court of South Africa. And that leads you to call up the, you know, a clerk from the Constitutional Court. And so it would, it would constantly be pulling thread. So I, I interviewed just hundreds of people. I do love the research rabbit holes that you can go yes. down. You know, that one thing will lead to something entirely different. And that's, that's half the fun, really. Exactly. <laughs> so it, it seems that the concept of street names didn't appear just in one place and yeah. then disseminate, uh, but rather it popped up organically in several parts of the world. So could you give us a few examples of the origins of formal street names as, as we know them today and how they differ from culture to culture? Yeah, I mean, you really can see a lot of the arc of how of, of changes across history through street names. So I live in England, for example, where a lot of the street names were entirely organic, and this is completely reflected on the landscape. So my UK publisher um, profile books, their offices are on a street that's called Cloth Fair, which I think is very lovely, Cloth Fair, because that was a cloth market, right? That's one of the old cloth markets. And if you walk around the city of London, this is absolutely true. You know, there's Fish Street, there's Haberdasher's Row, there's you know, all of London is sort of map. It's almost like a, a visual, um, sorry, an auditory map, right? Because you can totally imagine in the times before places were mapped and in, in a bustling city, this was how people got around and found what they needed to find. So in places, um, very old cities like this, this is how they arose. Now, the U.S. is a completely different story because when the U.S., uh, you know, when the European settlers came to the U.S., there, it wasn't mapped or there were no there were no streets in the sense of European streets. And so they, they, were, they were able to make sort of an artifice to street names and to reflect their values in the street names. And this is, is a concept that was really tied up with the Enlightenment, really tied up with the French Revolution. This idea that you could rename things and brand them was a, was, a, was a big aspect of the French Revolution. It's a big aspect of the book. In fact, I think one of the most important aspects of the book is how much the French Revolution caused us to, to, to think about this as, uh, as a branding exercise. So the U.S. did, did, you know, not only did they they grid streets, which we can talk about, and number streets, which is completely unheard of in, in Europe. You know, they're just, for the most part, they just are not numbered streets in Europe. Um, but they were also uh, reflecting um, the cultural values of democracy and equality and liberty, at least for those they considered worthy at that time of democracy, equality, and liberty on the streetscape. I noticed you touched on this concept very briefly, but um, what are the origins of house numbers and why were they implemented? I, I think the, the most interesting chapter in the book is on house numbers. And I think that was the one I was dreading the most because I thought it would be incredibly dull. It's entirely fascinating. The idea that house numbers, as some scholars have said, are one of the greatest inventions of the Enlightenment totally blew my mind. And here's, here's why. <laughs> so if you think about a time in history uh, where basically, you know, government wasn't what we see it as the modern government, right? So we have a ruler, often a man, sometimes a woman, who's like basically like a person with a big stick, right? And as long as the population is paying their taxes, and as long as they aren't trying to overthrow you, you know, they don't really care what you do. They don't care if you're in school, they don't care if you're healthy, they don't really care anything about you, right? But th this changes a lot where the governments um, during the Enlightenment started to get a lot more interesting in, in the people. I mean, sometimes from a welfare perspective, but also from a practical perspective of wanting to actually use them and do things like, like draft soldiers. So the chapter in the book I talk about is about Vienna. It's about Maria Theresa, who's this incredibly powerful um, empress of the Habsburg Empire. And she's got 16 children, which always blows my mind. And, uh, and she's the mother of Marie Antoinette, tying it back to the French Revolution. And she basically is fighting all of these wars all the time. And, but she realizes she actually doesn't really have enough soldiers and she doesn't even know what soldiers are out there because the local governments would sort of be responsible for, for bringing up soldiers. But of course they kept the good people back for themselves. So what she decides to do is to number all the houses. 
And so she sends in her military to number all of these houses, which people hate because they know exactly what's going on. That once they can be seen by the state, they can be used by the state, right? And so they protest, they, you know, people are sent to prison. This has become a big thing because they realize that something has changed. Now, this is not neutral, right? So you have things that people don't like, like being taxed and being drafted, and that's the way being found. But this, this also comes with some good things, like, you know, about the, you know, keeping track of people's welfare and being able to go to school. All of these things are all combined. And the way it's often described, if you read about it in like sociological research, is that the state began to see people, that the state before was blind. They had no idea who their people were. But as the Enlightenment went on, aspects like um like street numbering allowed them to see people and once they could see their citizens they could do all sorts of things with their citizens for better or for worse and it's something we don't think about now because we are so thoroughly seen by our by our governments yeah i actually noticed we got a really great comment that ties in perfectly to the next question so i'm going yeah. to put it up on the screen i will read the question and then i will read the comment as well sure. so the question is um in the address book you discuss homelessness as well as those who have a home, but no address. Yes. So I'm going to ask you what the disadvantages are of not having an address, but I also want to add in this comment, which says, hopefully Ms. Mask will be able to comment on the impact of street address issues on Native Americans who often yeah. struggle with not having formal street addresses because reservations aren't always mapped out as Absolutely. thoroughly as cities. Yes. Yes, exactly. So these are such great questions. I'm so glad you raised them. So the um, so I started off by talking about why why people in India need street addresses, and, and we think of Kolkata, India, as a very different place from from you know America. But actually, the homelessness problem illustrates exactly the same problems that these people in the slums in India have. Try to get a bank account without a street address. Try to vote. You're legally allowed to vote when you're homeless. It's extremely difficult. Um, try to get married, try to get, um, you know, try to get anything, try to get a passport, try to do anything in the world without a street address, and, and it's, it's virtually impossible. And what the chapter I write about in homelessness is, is really also about getting a job. So there's this story I tell us of this Yale law student who wrote this really fascinating law review article called Ban the Address, because she was asking people, she was uh, in New Haven, so it's a large homelessness problem, she would just ask people, like, what is it you need? You know, what is it you as a homeless person need? Of course, they needed homes. I mean, that goes without saying. But what they all told her is, I just need an address because I need to pass as not homeless. And she would interview, um, you know, managers at Pizza Hut or McDonald's and other places who said, yeah, they wouldn't hire homeless people. And um, or, or if you put the homeless shelter, they'll know. And, and everybody knows that so people who are homeless knows people who are hiring people who might be homeless know this. So ironically, all the research shows is that the easiest way of getting out of homelessness is to somehow pass as not being homeless, which is completely warped in every way, but but this is well known. So so she has a program called Ban the Address for partly these reasons, because people need addresses as a way of signaling that they're a secure member of society, and this is how we often judge this. Um, transitioning a Native American, it's a great point. I actually wrote an op-ed for the New York Times a few years ago about just this issue, because this had to do with uh, voting voting rights. Because as you said, a lot of Native American reservations aren't addressed. Um, a lot of times just because they're just extremely rural, just a lot of extremely rural places aren't addressed. So, so, and so these regulations were put on them by the Republicans to uh, stop them basically from, um, well, impute, purportedly, probably to stop Native Americans from voting. And, and this voter ID became extremely difficult and meant that many Native Americans were disenfranchised. I mean, so much so that there'd be, um, you know, when I was writing the op-ed interviewing a woman who was a voting official and her niece, you know, she wasn't even allowed to let her niece vote because her, her she didn't have the proper identification. I mean, it was completely absurd. And of course, and, and so um, it became a, a very live issue and it still remains a live issue about, um, about formalizing street addresses, partly because we connect street addresses and identity. And then this can be a manipulated. So there are clearly many downsides to not being able to um, acquire a street address. But conversely, are there any advantages you can think of to not having a street address? I mean, there are people who actively choose to not have a street address. This is, Claire, this is a good question and nobody ever asks it. So I'm so glad you did because this is a chapter I really wanted to write for the book but didn't have space. Because you're exactly right. There are benefits to not being found, right? So, so let's go back to the West Virginia story that I told about um, 
the state addressing people and people didn't want addresses. So I kind of would ask around when I was uh, reporting in West Virginia, why is it? Why, why don't people want these addresses? And people would say, oh, you know, they're just hicks. They're just ignorant. They don't know how the modern world works. And I'm like, okay. But, but it actually turns out that they were like cleverer than everybody else because they totally knew what this was about. Street addresses purportedly were about 911, which is absolutely true. You absolutely need addresses for 911. But they were also about finding people, policing people, taxing people. And this is also a downside that a lot of people didn't want. So interestingly, I think these people who are protesting against it had a lot more insight into addresses than, um, than, than, than the people who were doing the addressing themselves. And the way this often comes up in the U.S. is that there are some very rich places in the world that don't have, and the U.S. don't have street addresses. So you have Alpine, New Jersey, not too far from where you guys are now, one of those, the most expensive postcode, uh, zip codes uh, in America that does not have street addresses, or at least not uh, as far as my research a few years ago. Uh, mail is collected at the, at the post office for an anonymity sake, right? A lot of very famous celebrities live there, and they want complete anonymity. And, and somebody, a reader just recently sent me an article about Carmel, California, a similarly, you know, wealthy place that does not have uh, street addresses. Um, and there's a push to give them street addresses from the post office and they adamantly don't want it. I presume for the same kind of ability to not be seen. And it's exactly what those Viennese wanted in the what, 18th century. Um, they wanted, uh, they wanted anonymity. And, uh, and once you, you slap a number on the door, you lose that. And so, so there are some there are savvy people who now understand that 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 if you are in a position uh, to use this to your advantage, you can. That's so fascinating. I mean, as someone who's Gen Z, it is really hard for me to fathom living in a world where you are not kind of constantly being monitored in some way, shape, yes. or form. And so, Absolutely. like. The fact reading this book, the fact that you can even choose to not have an address is something I had never once considered in my life. I know. No, no, me either. Me either. People do, you know, and then, uh, but then it becomes a difficulty. I always get emails from RVers. I mean, RVers, like, I think addresses are like an obsession because this is a, this is a challenge for them getting identity. And I did a book club once for um, a large group of uh, women who were army wives. Uh, that's how they describe themselves. Um, and, and they had trouble with this, even though they're living on army bases, you know, in other countries. They have trouble in the U.S. not having a U.S. address, and even though they're under the the, the care of the U.S. in the, in the most meaningful sense. Um, so yeah, so, so it is a it is a difficult issue. Yeah, it's a fasc fascinating and incredibly complex concept for sure. It's a lot of different opinions and very very strong opinions from what I gather. <laughs> so what, always. I'm sorry. Oh no, no, I just said always, always complicated. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so uh, one section of your book that I really enjoyed. Um, so as a person who speaks both English and Japanese, um, I really enjoyed the section where you use English and Japanese to demonstrate how language influences the way we actually map out the world around us. So can you explain to us this theory of how different languages, particularly their writing systems, affect our mental mapping and as a result, how streets are designed? Yeah. I mean, every time I told people I was writing a book about street addresses, first they, you know, they would always say, you've got to write about Tokyo, which was a place, a city I still have never been to. But it, it's, it's famously a city that is hard for uh, Westerners or non-Japanese people to navigate because there are no street names in, in Tokyo. Uh, the way addresses work there is by blocks, right? You have neighborhoods and you also have um, the city is organized by blocks. You do have house numbers, but they aren't actually even an, an orderly number. They tend to be when the building was built. And famously, Tokyo buildings are short-lived. They're often knocked down and rebuilt again, um, unlike, unlike London, where I live, which is the exact opposite. So, so people just go crazy. And there, there's so much there. There are little, um, there are little police boxes that are on the road, and, and where you know, maybe one or two policemen. And a huge part of their job is giving directions. Now, obviously, this has changed quite a bit in the post-smartphone world where it's much easier to get around, but this baffles people why this might be. And, and so I was writing about this, and I came across this incredibly fascinating urban uh, urban planner. Um, he's an academic, uh, and he's from Nottingham, which is a city uh, in the north of England. And he, um, and he he lives in Japan. He speaks Japanese, and he has a Japanese wife. And once he was talking to his Japanese wife, and he was thinking about how she learned to read. So the way, you know, we English speakers learn to read was we have that lined paper. Like everybody remembers the lined paper and we practice our letters on the lines, right? I have young children. We do this a lot. 
Um, whereas in, in, in Japan, the paper is different. The paper is all boxes because, of course, the Japanese characters are, are whole, right? You're, you're, you're filling in the box uh, within of the character. It's not an alphabetic language. I mean, there's alphabetic elements to Japanese, but, you know, the characters largely bought far from Chinese script are, are um, you know, are characters rather than alphabets. And he, and he, he, it's just a theory, but I think it's a really interesting one that the way you write um, makes you see the world differently so that we see the world on lines, on streets, and they see the world, uh, and Japanese people see the world in boxes. And there's a lot of evidence that we use different aspects of our brain when we read. So, um, so for example, there's a lot of research on how language affects how we how we do things. So, for example, if you if you give an English speaker um, uh, a stack of cards, uh, say of a plant growing, you know, from a seed to a full grown plant, you know, you tell them to order, put them in the right order. Well, they'll put the seed on the left and they'll number it to the right the way we read. Now, if you take somebody who grew up uh, speaking Hebrew, where you read the opposite way, they do it the exact opposite way, right? They start on the left and go to the right. And there's lots more evidence about this. So the fact, so, so one of his theories, um, and this, there's a lot of evidence from this in the way that, that Japanese cities are designed and the way they're dressed, is that, is that it makes sense to a Japanese person to see a block, and it makes sense to a Western person to see a line. And uh, it's a theory that I love. It's, I believe it's called the, the superior wharf hypothesis, which is mm. when, um, the, yeah, speaking a new language actually affects how you yeah. think. I don't know if you've ever seen um, the movie Arrival, which is no, so. about, so really it, it to me is, is an example of taking that hypothesis to the absolute extreme. So it's yeah. actually a movie about aliens landing on earth. And so mm. these scientists have to go up and figure out how to communicate with them. And um, spoiler alert for anyone who doesn't want the movie spoilered. Um, yeah. It turns out that actually learning the alien language literally enables people to see bits of the future. Huh. And so it's how it literally rewires your brain. And I just think it's a great extreme, but great example of just that theory it's being so, shown. Yeah, it, I love to show people it. Exactly. And it was one thing that I never really thought about. You know, in, in the research, for example, you know, there's a lot of talk about the dyslexia. But there, we know that you can be dyslexic in English and read perfectly well in Japanese. Um, the, the mechanism of the mind works totally different. Um, so it does reframe a lot of the way about thinking about language and its connections to how we think and see and read. It's totally fascinating. Yes, I literally think differently in Japanese than I do in English. <laughs> it's literally like, it, it, I'm a different person. It's so weird. Yes. <laughs> but bringing things to kind of a more local level, so Westport is pretty close to New York City. Yeah. And many Westporters commute daily to New York City for their jobs. And they are very familiar with Manhattan's grid layout and the numbered streets it uses. So I'm wondering, how did Manhattan's layout come to be? And yeah. what are the origins of cities being designed in this kind of grid pattern? Yes, I mean, it's totally fascinating. It goes back to a little of what I said was that, I mean, one thing that I learned a lot about, uh, I was learning about Manhattan, and, and, and when it was Man Manhattan, basically, which is maybe roughly the, the Lenape term for it, which was like amazing. Like Manhattan was going to be amazing whether it was developed or not. I mean, it had like more ecological species than Yellowstone. I highly encourage everybody um, to, to research how incredibly astounding uh, Manhattan was in terms of its geography, in terms of its ecology, in terms of, you know, all of the animals that lived there, bears. I mean, it, it was an amazing place. So they get there and it's just totally wild uh, land, right? And then the Dutch sort of obviously build some roads, but it's obviously, as we know, New York grows extremely fast, extremely quickly. So they're like, we need some city plan. We don't want it to be higgledy-piggledy like London, say, which has no grid at all. So basically appoint these three um, these three guys, basically, um, you know, one of them was responsible for writing We the People in the Constitution. And to be honest, it seems like they didn't spend a ton of time on it. I think they were just like, okay, we're just going to make some straight lines. Um, and, uh, and you know, they, it, this is 1811, and they basically just grid the city. And some people connect it to Manhattan has always been about money. Everything's always been about money with Manhattan. You know, even the Dutch were there about money. They weren't really into settling it. They kind of liked their own homeland. So you didn't get even that many Dutch immigrants. It was really all about money, whereas Boston was very different. Boston grew up very differently. It's all about education. So people connect this with Manhattan. So, th so they basically just decided to grid it. And some people say just because it's cheaper to do that way. And, and it makes land like poker chips. It makes it incredibly easy to buy and sell land when it's gridded. And then they numbered all of the streets. So this is the, the sort of rough history of how it comes about. Central Park was only added uh, much later. Um, at the, the, the commissioners who designed this, they were like, oh, we're an island. We're surrounded by loads of fresh air. We don't need any parks. And they were proven wrong. And 
Central Park was added in what the 18, 1850s, I think. And um, but but interestingly, when I was reading about Manhattan, you can't really talk about the Manhattan Grid without talking about um, a city not far away, which is Philadelphia. So we have Philadelphia, which is the first planned city in America um, by the European civil settlers. Uh, William Penn, who's this. Uh, complicated, but I think amazingly charismatic character. He's a Quaker. Um, he basically uh, he basically inherits the land of Pennsylvania. He his father owed a debt to the king, and he the king pays off this debt. I'm sorry, the king owed a debt to his father. The king pays off this debt with all this land, and also William Penn is incredibly annoying to him because he's this Quaker, and that was when Quakerism was banned. Well, Band is a difficult word. It was this complicated relationship in England. So he gets rid of this, and William Penn really found Pennsylvania as a haven for people of all different uh, religious sensibilities. But anyway, so he goes over and he decides to grit it. So why did he, in the 17th century, do something so radically different from what he grew up as a Londoner? Well, William Penn, remember, was in the time of the Great Fire of London, which every year one student, kindergarten student uh, in England, learns about. Which, is in, which was in what 1666, basically all of, you know, most of London is burned in this massive fire. Um, and the fire started in the King's Bakery. It was this absolute disaster. Samuel Pepys wrote about it. And Samuel Pepys was actually a neighbor of William Penn's father who appears in this, uh, in this discourse on the Great Fire of London because they're burying their Parmesan cheese to protect it from the fire. So, so William Penn, uh, you know, their homes actually weren't destroyed in fire, but he's very aware of the fire. And one of the reasons why the fire spread so quickly is that there's no city plan, right? Like they have all these timber houses and they're all right next to each other and they connect and they cross and the houses are super close together so fire can leap. And we think that William Penn was like, this won't happen in my new city. So he makes them spaced out apart and very, and very even in a way that makes sense uh, from a fire perspective. But that doesn't explain why the streets were numbered. So he sends over his surveyor. He tries to name them in the European way by giving them like um, naming them after people, including himself. And the Penn was a was a Quaker. He didn't believe in naming things after people. Um, and in fact, you have Pennsylvania, which the, the the king insisted not named after William Penn's, but named after William Penn's father, who, the, who was a great friend of the king. So we have Pennsylvania, not even named after William Penn. And Penn comes in and says, no, 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 we aren't doing this. We aren't naming after people. We're going to name some of the streets after plants, uh, uh, trees, Maple Street, Oak Street, that kind of thing. And then the rest of them were going to number. And then there was a Quaker tradition of numbering, say, uh, month names uh, that were considered pagan. Um, so he, so we don't know this for sure, but the but the wisdom seems to be that he borrowed from this, uh, from this religion of simplicity and equality to number the streets. And then New York simply kind of copied that. Um, but then, of course, the rest of the country copied it because then, you know, after the American Revolution, you have all of this land that has to be gridded and addressed and named. And how do you do it? Thomas Jefferson comes up with this idea. Look, we're just going to survey it and we're going to grid. We're going to grid the West. And for ease's sake, they often ended up just numbering the streets. So this is why if you go to Kansas, as it was recently in Kansas, it's all numbers. It's all streets. It's all square lines. Right. It couldn't be more different than, than William Penn's own homeland. So that's the longer story about the Manhattan Grid. So it seems like the, the US and UK in some ways are almost opposite in the street naming. In, in the UK, yeah. it seems it, was very it came up very naturally, just whatever was there you named it after. Whereas Absolutely. In the US, and they like it that way because you do, right? So after the Great Fire, there were proposals to do everything Penn did. There were lots of proposals to grid the streets, and Penn surely knew about this. But, you know, people always like what they had, right? Like people, they don't want to change. Nobody likes change. And so they just uh, they just kind of built it up the same way it was before. Um, so London could have, looked, could have looked like New York long before New York looked like New York. But there was an active decision not to do that. And that's what makes them very different uh, cities to navigate and experience. Yeah, you mentioned kind of the aesthetic versus function in the book of the two. Yeah, whereas, yeah exactly. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think New York is very beautiful. But, you know, for but there was always this question about whether, you know, whether New York is beautiful. And there's this great line from this immigrant uh, Dutchman, Danish man, I can't remember, who's asked this question. And he says, well, New York's not supposed to be beautiful, right? Beauty is only really possible in cities and in, in countries where wealth equality is so vast, right? Like what's Paris without the monarchy, I mean, which the French revolutionaries very well knew. I mean, there were some French revolutionaries who wanted to raise Paris because how do you build Paris without the labor of, of, of you know, of the working class 
and the great wealth of kings. It's impossible. London's not that far off, right? This was the inequality is the basis of the beauty of Europe. I mean, you can't see it without thinking about that, or you can, but you shouldn't. And, uh, and New York wasn't ever supposed to be like that. Now, times have changed. I don't think it's that different anymore, probably. I think we're probably going in that direction as well. But there was some sense that New York was not going to be like this, right? New York wasn't supposed to be beautiful. It wasn't supposed to have a big church in the middle of it that was the state church. It wasn't supposed to have all this. It was supposed to be equal, and the, the grid reflected that. Interesting. So getting kind of into the more political aspect yeah. of street names, I'm going to kind of throw two questions at you at once here, really. Yeah. So bear with me. Yeah. Um, so in the address book, you state that, quote, to name something is to assert power over it. Mm -hmm. So first question, yeah. how does naming streets after political figures and regimes shape the narrative of a city? And yeah. kind of building off of that, you, you also refer to street names as the, quote, perfect propaganda tool. So why are street names, something many people don't even think twice about, such an effective means of deciding which histories get shared and which histories get repressed? Oh, it's such a, oh yeah, absolutely. Well, starting with your point, naming is power. I mean, it starts in the Bible, right? So what happens? God names Adam, and who does Adam name? Eve and all the other animals, right? And this, is, this, this power dynamic related to naming is from the very beginning. And we see it now, right? Because the people who, I was, people who write history books are also ones who write the street names because it's the people in power. This is done by government. And this has large, largely been used as a propaganda tool because when you're choosing to name a street, you're choosing to honor somebody. Um, but the reason why it's the perfect propaganda tool is that people are then forced to use that name. So I think often the obsession is over monuments, but you know, nobody ever actually looks at a monument. I don't know if you've noticed that. I live in London where there's monuments everywhere and I couldn't tell you what they are. You just pass by them. Street names, you have to use them. They are so much more imprinted, I think, in our brain. And if it's your address, you actually have to write them, right? So they become, um, they become symbols uh, of this power dynamic. And I was once talking to an academic who made a really good point about it about why street names change during times of crisis or civil war. So, so there are streets in, uh, in you know, Eastern Europe that the main street's been named eight or nine times in the 20th century alone, right? Because every time somebody new came in, the first thing they do is change the streets. First thing the Nazis did was change the streets. First thing everybody, it's not just not, first thing everybody does is change the streets. There are very famous pictures of um, American GIs pulling down Adolf Hitler's Strasse streets. You know, this is what we always do. Um, you know, on the very first day, the very first meeting of the mayors of Berlin, what's the what's on their agenda on their first meeting? We've got to change all these Nazi street names, right? So it becomes this sort of um, this powerful propaganda tool, and we see it today. So I was recently having dinner with a friend uh, who's who's a refugee from Ukraine, and she's from Mariupol, which has been which used to be a beautiful city and has been was had a, a terrible three month siege and is now uh, completely uh, bombed out and you know most of the population has fled. And she made this very point that in, in Ukraine, there's been a process of, of getting the Russians literally off the streets, but also off the street names. So they've changed you know, hundreds of names, probably thousands of names um, since the nineties. And, and you know, some of them were quite clever, like they would change L-E-N-I-N Street, Lenin Street, to L-E-N-N-O-N Street, like John Lennon, right? Which I thought was like a lovely tribute to John Lennon. But of course, they're changing all the streets. So she was talking about in Mariupol, how there were Peace Street and uh, Freedom Street that had reverted to their, um, that had reverted to the, to Lenin Street again, right? And this is something we do all the time. And it's, and it's the basis of so many debates about street names. Um, so the academic I was saying, which I didn't finish my thought, he made this point. He said that, that especially when there's like a civil war, it can be really hard to know that anything has changed. Um, because in a regular war, right, you're in Paris in the 1940s and there are German soldiers sitting at your table. You know what's going on, but it's not always that way. So you can't take the space from the outside because it's a civil war, but you can take the space from the inside. And how do you take the space from the inside? You rename everything. And again, going back to the French Revolution, it's exactly what the revolutionaries did in France. Um, they decided not to raise Paris. They decided to just rename everything, revolutionary names, and that was going to make it all better. And we still do this. So kind of on that note of, of street names and the influence of history and regimes, how is America's legacy of slavery and colonization embedded into our street names? And what can be done, if anything, to combat this? Mm. Well, there are overt ways that this happens, and there are some more subtle ways that this happens. So starting with the subtle way, 
the subtle way is, as I said, like people who write the history books write the street names, right? So a lot of street names, um, not even of slaveholders, are names that were chosen because they're often sort of white, powerful men. You know, we are not honoring um, minorities, we're not honoring women, we're not honoring lots of people. We are not honoring the kind of work that women used to do because we're honoring, uh, you know, the leaders who are able to get uh, elected or getting get in power. So there's the subtle way that this looks that we aren't always noticing. But there are the overt ways where you have Robert E. Lee streets, or there was a famous street in Selma that was uh, Martin Luther King's Jr. Street that interconnected with the Jefferson Davis Street, right? And the interesting thing about these street names is that these are not street names that are left over from pre-Civil War times. Um, these are street names that were actively added during times of civil rights um, upheaval in America. And they were threats, right? Like they were put there on purpose to intimidate uh, the black, black, you know, black people, basically, and to assert power in exactly the same way that we said. And many of these overt street names have changed, are in the process of being changed, but but not all of them. But people have a really hard time changing street names for all sorts of reasons. I mean, there are the people who simply believe that Robert E. Lee is someone who deserves to be respected, and it's hard to have a conversation with that person, in my opinion. But people feel really connected to their street names. I mean, there would be people who say, I don't care anything about Robert E. Lee. But you know what? I got married on Lee Street, and I brought my babies home from the hospital on Lee Street. And Lee Street has been my address for 75 years. This will not be Lee Street if we change it to Freedom Street. And in theory, this sounds kind of ridiculous. But in practice, people genuinely feel this way. And so I'm not saying nostalgia is a reason not to change the street name. I don't believe that. But it's important to grapple with the complicated feelings that people have about these names. Um, that, aren't, that aren't always obvious, and that always came up when I would talk to people. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think these opportunities are actually kind of amazing, because when I was researching, sorry, the light is following me. Uh, when I was researching, I would just find, um, I would just, you know, find these small communities having these intense debates about the meaning of the Civil War in their town hall. I mean, when does that happen? That people from all sides get together and talk about this and argue about this, like never. Like street names are the vehicle that people talk about these. And so there'd always be somebody saying, why don't we just number all the streets or something? But I like the arguments. I mean, arguments I talk about in the book, they divide communities, right? But they also create communities. It's like a chance to talk about what matters to you. So sometimes I think the result isn't as important as the fact that people are given a forum and an, and an opportunity to actually engage with the issues with their neighbors. Yeah, so we've been talking a lot about, you know, the concept of changing street names and how frequently they've changed in some spaces. But the changing of street names has been kind of turned into this commodity that can be bought and sold. You can purchase a street and name it yourself. So how did this come to be? And what are the effects of people, particularly wealthy people, purchasing yeah. and determining what our streets are called? Yeah, well, it's hard. I mean, the best place to start is with Manhattan, which is in, totally insane. You are, at least until the last time I checked in the last few years, you can, if you're a developer, you could pay at the time it was $11,000, this is not a lot of money, to petition the city to change your street name, right? To change the street name of your building. So, so the classic example is you have a, an incredibly expensive building um, built on the, you know, built a, uh, you know, built a, few, a block away from Park Avenue that gets a block, the uh, Park Avenue address, right? So they pay the city, so they aren't actually on Park Avenue, um, you know, not a whole block, but a few, a few hundred meters from Park Avenue, but they get the Park Avenue street name, even though they aren't actually on Park Avenue. I mean, this is very common in New York. I think David Dinkins brought it, uh, brought it in, I think, as a way when people weren't investing in New York, it was like a lure, like you can build on these cities. Donald Trump did it. Uh, he was a very early adopter of his of, uh, of putting buildings on, like, say, Central Park West. But, you know, you could say it's a Donald Trump thing, but honestly, they all do it. <laughs> all developers were doing this. They've cut back on this dramatically in recent years. I'd be surprised if they're allowing this. But the, but the, but the remains of it are still scattered all around Manhattan. And they named it themselves. They named it the Vanity Street Address. That's what, they, that's what the program is called by the city itself. Because what always amazes me is these these are very expensive buildings. You know, the, the apartments in here go for, you know, go for tens of millions of dollars. So it amazed me that the developer and perhaps the people who buy this apartment still care that they have a Park Avenue address. I mean, you're rich enough. You're enough of a baller that you have this it's like $25 million apartment. And you're living in this whole entirely limestone building. 
and you still actually care that you write it down. Like, I think that says a lot about human nature and it's not good, but it's actually part of a bigger story. It goes back to how streets were named because the way modernity has worked is that we're just more conscious consumers of everything. We just, we, we label things in a consumer way much more than they did say in London when they were naming streets Hog Lane. They weren't thinking of it as resale value or what it sounds like. It simply wasn't an aspect of society and culture in the way that it is now. Whereas if you're a developer, a suburban property developer, you're working really, really hard to come up with street names that will appeal to your buyers. And why wouldn't you, right? So you, so you name them after flowers or lakes or, um, or, you know, lovely words, lovely, meaningless things often. Right. And it's very lovely, but it's often very meaningless. And I think this always kind of gets me down when I drive through suburban neighborhoods that we've kind of lost any sense of the connection between the land and the geography. And, and where I'm from in North Carolina, the way the geography comes up is that they'll bulldoze something and then name the, the subdivision after it. Right. So there'll be, there would have been a, you know, a beautiful farm there. So they named the subdivision after the farm they just raised. And that's the, that's the last link to the history that you get. And I, I have to say, I do find it a bit depressing. Yeah. So before we head on to yeah. um, my final question, we breeze through these. Wow. Um, I want to remind the audience that uh, we are happy to accept any audience questions and we will happily answer them. So I am kind of giving the, the final call to think up your questions and write them down if you have any for us today. So with that being said, um, my final question for yeah. you is so many people, I mean, myself included, yeah. constantly rely on navigators like Google Maps to get around in our day-to-day -day lives. Kind of embarrassing to admit, but it's true. I don't even know the street names of a lot of my local streets and I have lived here my entire life. Yeah, I feel um, the same way. <laughs> yeah. So how can we encourage people today to take an interest in the history of their local street names if really yeah. their only perceived value is to be plugged into a navigation app? It's true. And there's a chapter in my book, which goes into this, um, people are interested about the neuroscience of how our brains are changing for this very reason, being plugged into Google Maps. I find it really hard myself because I have no natural navigational skills. So I, I think I rely on Google Maps more than anyone. And I actually write about street names. I think there's two points. I think a lot of people actually are very interested in them, judging from the letters that I get. So there are a lot of historical societies who have done quite in-depth research on the street names. And so I think, I'm sure there's one down in Westport, maybe there's a, I think it's worth reaching out and finding these people and finding out the origins of street names. But also just encouraging more natural, now I went on a workshop that was about more natural navigation through landmarks, through seeing the land. And it's funny, like my children are way better at this than I am, way better at navigating our neighborhood and landmarks and things like that because they don't have phones. <laughs> and maybe there's also this childlike aspect. So. I think it's only since I've been writing this book, um, again, that I start to look at the street names and I start to wonder, or, you know, we've been doing a, we live on Wilberforce Road, which I absolutely love. Wilberforce was a slightly complicated man, but in general, a, a great force for good in England and abolishing, he's basically responsible for leading the abolition of the slave trade in the UK. And, uh, and I, I love that I live on Wilberforce Road, but you know, we're now looking for a, a bigger place to live. And I keep looking at the street names and, and I research the street names and I'll send my husband, oh, Panning, I don't know, he's a prime, he wasn't great, was he? You know, we're always looking at these different names because now I'm just committed to living on a street name that aligns with my own values, uh, which is not easy uh, in England. Um, so anyway, so, uh, so I encourage people to try, but it's an uphill battle. Yeah, so I started looking more into our street names and realizing, I'm like, oh, that last name was a prominent family. Oh, this is because of this landmark. And it's like so much more opens up the second you start even considering it. So Absolutely. I agree. I think it's fun to just go out into your own neighborhood and just say, whoa, why is this called Turkey Hill Road? Exactly. Hmm. Which is a real one that I Googled because I was like, why is it called Turkey Hill there Road? We go. Um, <laughs> so we do actually have an audience question here, which I will put up on the screen, but I will also read for us. Yeah. It is, what suggestions, Re? how can a community come together to start the conversation about street names? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I think the way it often comes up, um, and it's hard to think of other ways that this happens, is that somebody starts to think, starts to do exactly the research you were saying you do. They start looking it up and they start thinking, oh yeah, we have the streets that's named after a slaveholder or named after, 
somebody that we don't value or or any kind of value principle and we want this and, and we want to talk about the problematic of this and, and maybe find another solution to renaming it or the opposite happens somebody very important dies or there's somebody we really want to honor so there's a whole chapter in the book about martin luther king jr streets where people were proposing changing street names to martin luther king after his death and many years after his death still um, to name streets after. So often it comes through a sort of a value check about trying to align your, again, it's not just your personal values, this is one of the things that makes it interesting, but your community values around the name. So often, yes, it will come from exactly those questions. You start looking into something and you realize that that this is a problematic name and however you define problematic. Um, or you start thinking, look, we have this great um, former citizen of Westport, um, a woman, um, you know, uh, somebody who was black or Native American, like this person who's been overlooked by history. And this is somebody we really deserve to honor. And this is another way that this often comes out. Um, and this can be a really meaningful conversation for communities to have. So it's a great question. Absolutely. So that concludes really all the questions we have for today. So I want to thank our audience so much for joining us. And um, if you want to get your own copy of the address book, we, oh, we did get another question. So I will stop doing the outro and I'll read that question for you. So I'm going to bring that up on the screen. Yeah. It says the outer boroughs of New York City seem less prone to naming via a grid system. What do mm -hmm. you think disposes a community to be prone to, to grinding, grinding good, yeah. versus yeah. another system? Yeah, I think it all comes down to planning, right? So a lot of places, if they were rigorously planned at the start, like certain cities, they were gridded because you have this body that has this interest often in gridding to sell land really quickly. Whereas a lot of the outlying communities that now might actually be quite urban, they were considered the like the like villages, right? This is, happens in London all the time, that, that, that London just swallowed, for example, the whole villages. And I imagine something like that often happens in New York where you have these sort of country estates with these lovely winding roads. And who would think of gridding this country estate, you know, at the time when they were doing these sort of mass city planning projects. So I, I assume, my, my, my assumption probably is that a lot of the, the outer boroughs were exactly, were exactly like that. They were just simply off the map at the time. I mean, if you remember, I mean, we think of New York as being New York for so long, but if you think about, you know, George Washington, uh, you know, was riding through Times Square, cutting down cornfields, right? Like that's, that in the industry is not really that long ago that we're raising cornfields during the Revolutionary War. And, and, you know, you can read Civil War history as well, which talks about how incredibly, you know, bucolic and rural New York was. So if you imagine that Manhattan was like that, how much more so were the outer boroughs? So I think that's probably the history that they just simply weren't, weren't really seen as being part of the city at the time. But I, I don't know that for sure, but that's my guess. Great. I mean, sometimes the best we can give is, is an educated guess. Yes, absolutely. It's something fun is the theorizing. <laughs> All right. So unless another question pops up, I do want to thank our audience so much for coming. And if you do want your own copy of the address book, we recommend going to bookshop.org to support local booksellers. So thank you once again to our audience. And thank you so much, Ms. Matthews. Thank for you for having me. This is delightful. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, everybody. Okay. Bye.